You're listening to the dialogue with Dewey De Boer on Reality Check Radio. We discuss politics, power, and culture. We are joined now by Peter Berenger, a member of the Bundestag for the Alternative for Deutschland, the AFD. Uh, he is the vice chairman and finance spokesman. I hear he is also a fan of uh, Austrian economist Friedrich von Hayek, who's famous for his book, The Road to Serfdom, of which I'm a, a fan of also. And it's been almost exactly one year since he was on the RCR Breakfast Show with Paul Brennan in September last year. So welcome back to Reality Check Radio. Thank you. So we've just won two state level elections this week. And there are some more ahead in which you're polling well. I say one, I mean, you've done very well. You can you can tell us a little bit about how happy you are with those results. And these are both in the East as well. And so could you tell us a little bit about why you think the message of the AFD is, is doing very well in the ex-communist East? <laughs> well, starting off with the results, uh, we got close to one third of the election poll. So um, one third, every third voter almost voted for us in both states, Thuringia and Saxony. Um, well, it's a little bit easier for us in the East, which has several reasons. The main reason probably is uh, those people have what I call totalitarian experience from the former GDR. Of course, it was something different than what we're experiencing today, and uh, we're not yet at that stage. But people do not believe in the mass media uh, as much as the West Germans do. There really is a cultural difference here, uh, especially when it comes to media reception. And uh, well, this is the main reason. In, in nowadays, completely lying and framing media, mainstream media in Germany, it is, uh, uh, is positive not to review the mass media at all. Even if you do not listen to alternative media, even if you do not listen to media at all, you are probably better informed than the Western Germans, uh, especially when it comes to AFD party, because 90% of what is being published uh, about us, and that does not only hold in Germany, that is also true internationally, uh, is false. It's plainly false. Uh, that is uh, probably the main reason, the media reason, uh, and the uh, historical experience, which is different in the East and the West. Uh, there may be a few other reasons, but uh, that's why we're polling pretty good in, in the East. And what were the big issues in this election? Because this is a, a local election as well. Are they local issues that are propelling you forward in these elections? Or is it are all of these uh, issues connected? You're doing well because of your stance that you're taking in the national parliament. Well, in some states in Germany, we have 16 of them. Um, sometimes local and regional uh, topics do play a role. Here, almost all parties agreed uh, that it was uh, a small federal election, uh, which probably also went in our favor because we are not so famous for our uh, regional um, politics because A, we do not yet have a regional government uh, and, and people there. And secondly, most of our imp most important topics uh, along which we founded ourselves, EU criticism, immigration, um, wokeness, um, the war in the meantime, uh, the CO2 topic, uh, all of that is at least uh, a nationwide topic. In many respects, it is uh, international things. And on all of these issues, I think the establishment is failing in Germany then. All the main parties you said are sort of agreed on those issues and you're different and that's why you're doing so well. Of course, we have to differentiate a little bit. Uh, our opponent, uh, on paper, our opponents are very different. Uh, they vary from the Christian Democrats, which used to be in the long past, um, a long time ago, uh, as the name says, Christian and very conservative um, party. Uh, and we also are seeing the former Communist Party, which have a direct line to the former uh, Social uh, Unity Party of the GDR, communists, and, and they still are communists. <laughs> So um, not, not a lot has changed, even though they do not refer to the GDR any longer. But uh, when it comes to central planning, economy and, and stuff like that, uh, nothing has changed since the 1980s. <laughs> um, um, so this is the span. We also see liberals on paper uh, who are no longer liberals, I must say. And then we have, of course, the classical social democrats, uh, which used to be a workers party 150 years ago and probably still 40 years ago, uh, no longer so. Uh, 
uh, everything has changed here. These parties still are there by name, um, but uh, they have changed a lot with the possible exception of the former communists who haven't changed. Um, and yes, in most aspects, not all of them, uh, there are a few exceptions. We are the only ones citing and speaking out about the life lies, as I call them, in many respects, uh, being an energy policy, immigration policy, uh, uh, cultural policy, especially the bokeness, which is an international phenomenon, of course. I know you know that too, <laughs> down under. Um, uh, the war thing, um, interestingly enough, uh, with at least one of the leftist parties we, uh, who has still stuck to their uh, pacifist um, former stance, uh, we do agree to some extent. We're not a pacifist party, but uh, we do not believe that the Ukraine war, and maybe we can go into that a little later, um, is our war. Uh, you can argue who is the aggressor here, and yes, Russia does uh, uh, play a bad role, but it is not so easy. Uh, this is uh, not only a Russian war, and it has a uh, this war history and pre-war history goes back way behind uh, 2022 when the war officially started. But we can go into that later. Um, what else? Uh, there's the economic uh, policy. There's, of course, the topic of immigration, which is probably, especially in those two states where we have had the election now, something which horrifies people most. Uh, I can, of course, go into detail here too. But uh, yes, in almost all those respects, uh, we are a minority party, but it is a minority which has now gained a third of the seats. Uh, so we are no longer uh, a small minority. And I believe the thing that all of these parties do agree on is keeping you out of government. So Absolutely. the AFD has, has never been in government. And so with these victories, now that you're the largest party in at least uh, one of these states, Thuringia, I believe, and second largest in Saxony, what can you accomplish with these state level victories? Can you get a policy? Can you be part of government or is the story still the same? Officially, if everything were in order in Germany, with, uh, if everything were as it has been for decades now, we would have a clear order by the voters uh, to form a government. Uh, we are by far the largest party in Thuringia, 33% versus 23, which is the um, Christian Democrats. So those two alone who are closest together uh, ideologically, um, not close, but closest, um, could form uh, with six. 60% of votes almost uh, easily in a, a government. Uh, but that is completely out of the question. Uh, nobody even thinks about that. Uh, and all the others together, all other parties together, which is four in Thuringia and I think even five in Saxonia, um, have to, um, well, collaborate <laughs> against us, despite all their internal differences. Of course, there are huge differences uh, between those parties. Uh, but uh, obviously, their main objective is to keep us out of um, business, out of the government, uh, because we were so radical. Everything is, everybody says, and has been saying that for more than 12 years in our party history, which is plainly wrong. It is a framing which is completely wrong. It's the only argument obviously left against us. Uh, both the media and the other parties uh, use that all the time. And I know th uh, that the same is true internationally. It's almost uh, the Third Reich or the Fourth Reich in Germany is invoked uh, by the media, which is absolutely rubbish. It's complete rubbish. Our program is uh, more or less what the Christian Democrats and even the Social Democrats have had uh, 30 years ago. It's not longer than that. Uh, we only would like to see some workers' rights, some um, people's rights, uh, a good economy, of course, a lot less immigration uh, and a sane um, uh, economic policy and especially energy policy. Uh, Germany is the only country in the world who has abandoned both nuclear power and coal power at the same time, um, which is almost undoable. And uh, also uh, regarding the war in the Ukraine, which is very costly um, and, uh, of course, tragic, tragic, obviously, and it is not our war. We dare to differ and uh, people believe in us. Despite all that media hysteria against us, uh, it's every third voter voting for us. So um, it's interesting because people do believe in the media and uh, one third of them do not even believe in the media, but they vote for us, which is a huge step. And uh, so we are we're getting ahead, but it's still uh, almost impossible to get into power. We will need 50%. Uh, well, when I last spoke with um, Paul uh, on your show a year ago, um, 
well, on a federal level, we were at 22%. We're still at that uh, level. Uh, so we have to gain a little more, but uh, we are not radical. This is really the main message I would like to, to send to your listeners. And you said your, your policies are fairly normal, at least by the standards of a generation ago. But mm. a lot of the criticism that you get from the mainstream media may be around people like your, I think, a faction leader in Thuringia, Bjorn Hock. He's been fined for using slogans that are banned in Germany. And so we see this in the, in the international media as well. So how do you respond to these allegations that your people are uh, secretly wanting to take Germany down a dark path again? And even if your policy is normal? But both nationally and internationally, it's uh, three or four people of our party who are depicted all the time. In this case, it happens to be in the leader of Thuringia, of our uh, party. But obviously, in 15 other regional elections, he's not the leader. He's, he's not even a member of the main board. Um, I'm one of those members, so we have 14 of them. Um, so he is important, but he's not the most important and uh, figure in our party. Um, so th this is first. Uh, having said that, and he too is not a radical. Um, he's demonized uh, all the time by uh, by the media. Every word is really turned to, to the opposite, <laughs> meaning whatever he says. Uh, so uh, he's being treated completely unfairly. And the demonization here is incredible, absolutely incredible. But what can I say? It's hard to prove that uh, in an, to an English-speaking setup, especially when every article you're Googling <laughs> regarding him, his, this person, is completely uh, one-sided uh, framing. The fines you mentioned, we have an agency called the Constitution Agency. Officially, they're in order to protect our Constitution against people who go against the law by force. But these days, um, especially against us and very especially against Bern Höcke, uh, they only weigh words and uh, treat warnings, which we uh, speak out all the time, as um, plans, especially as plans to plot the government and to overthrow democracy and everything. This is all complete rubbish. We are the most democratic party. <laughs> we never, ever have uh, said anything against democracy. We would never do that. Uh, I've been writing all our programs of the party for 10 years now. Nothing is there in there which is undemocratic. But everybody refers to some lapsus linguae, some um, wrong words, uh, which some people allegedly use. Uh, this is not serious at all. Well, I think I was just thinking, if one third of, of the people are in, in his state are voting for him, then maybe that's a good sign that they don't think that he's dangerous or taking them down a dark path, because then you'd have to accuse one third of Germans uh, in that area of being like that. So this this in turn is undemocratic. Uh, we have had an interview with the um, Christian Democrat um, man and candidate in Thuringia, uh, this very state of Björn Höckes, um, after the election. And uh, the moderator from the state media seriously asked him the question, well, you, Mr. Blah, blah Mr. X, uh, you are um, now the person who gained the most democratic votes in Thuringia. Um, his party got 23%, we got 33 So this person, this moderator, implicitly said that 33% of people did not cast a democratic vote, which is a contradiction in itself. Obviously, every vote is automatically a democratic vote. How can it be any different? <laughs> and he ruled that out, uh, which is a joke. It's, it's completely undemocratic what is being, we are, what we are being accused of, these people uh, do themselves. And I think one more question on, on policy, and perhaps we'll get into some of your policies and issues now. And the policy that maybe has got the most debate on social media is your policy on immigration, particularly on uh, repatriation or remigration, sometimes as it's called, of immigrants that you don't want in Germany and trying to encourage or trying to encourage refugees to go back home. So what are you proposing on your immigration policy specifically? And what are your voters like about this policy? Here too, everybody is referring to so-called remigration demands. Uh, what we have is immigration demands, and we would like to see a lot less of that. Um, there is an article in the German constitution, as in probably most constitutions of the world, granting political asylum uh, to politically persecuted persons. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, I would say about every 
one percent, maybe even every thousandth uh, people person coming into Germany qualifies uh, for asylum under that article. Almost nobody is individually persecuted for political reasons, but that is the main reason uh, our constitution grants uh, the right uh, to asylum. And we never questioned that as a party. Uh, no, it's not a problem. This is not a big deal. Uh, it would be 1%, maybe only a tenth of a percent of those people coming in. And we're talking about half a million net influx into Germany every year. It's incredible. Uh, in the last 10 years, uh, we have seen more than five, some say uh, even 10 million people coming in uh, and, and we are some 70, 75 million. So that is a huge change in society and uh, it is not legal immigration. It is illegal immigration. We, we do also have a few uh, European Union laws, but other European countries uh, plainly uh, ignored those. <laughs> and then we have the so-called Geneva Convention, um, which was uh, well in power all the time for decades. And it was never a problem up until 2015, when our former Chancellor Merkel, Mrs. Merkel, um, abandoned our borders. She really abandoned the borders. She just gave them up. She invited everybody in, basically, and just compare that to what, uh, for example, Australia did with that very clear message uh, the uh, Australians sent to the world, you will never make Australia home. This is basically what we demand too. It's nothing serious about that. Uh, you don't see uh, uh, Nazis in Australia, do you? Uh, and we demand the same thing. Uh, just two days ago, a Swiss tabloid, uh, the main Swiss tabloid called Blick, they said uh, what AFD in Germany demand is reality politics in Switzerland. It is just normal. And, and it was normal up until 2015, especially, and especially uh, 20 or 30 years ago. This What we demand was less than what the Christian Democrats and even the Social Democrats demanded 20 years ago. There is nothing radical about that. Otherwise, uh, we would have had uh, millions and millions of Nazis uh, 20 years ago in Germany. You can really see that very quick leftward shift, that that progressive shift, uh, the mainstream media programming of people just over a very quick space of time. But are you now seeing that uh, turn back, especially with younger voters? And uh, we see this in many countries and, and I think in New Zealand as well. And I saw the numbers for the state election in Germany. I think the majority of young people were voting for right-wing parties or um, anti-immigration parties. Is there going to be a shift back now, you believe, in the next generation? Um, and that the young people really are the future of your party and that they're going to turn things around and, and, and that you will increase your polling throughout the, the entire country and get to the level that you need to be. Yes, I can confirm that from the numbers we've had, uh, both from the polling institutions and from the election results. Um, the under 25 ages in Thuringia, uh, I think by 38% have voted for my party, even a lot more than in, in the overall results. And the same for Saxony, and we see that on a federal level too. And I can understand those young people. Um, some of them are maybe, uh, it's the same phenomenon. A, they do not listen to the mainstream media any longer. And this is a, a positive thing, because if you do not do that, you are not being brainwashed every day. So uh, you have a clear picture on the on, on the world. And secondly, those young people look around themselves. They see they, uh, for the first uh, generation in, in centuries, they do not have the same chances than their parents had. And uh, we all, almost always, for, for hundreds of years, have had, with the possible exception of wars, war times, uh, we have seen uh, the younger generation leading a better life than the, the older ones. And this has changed, and this generation is realizing that. And I cannot even blame them, because it's just true. It's the environment, the... Uh, social interactions between people has changed in the last 10 years to the worse. People are not so friendly any longer. They do not get along with each other. And this is, has nothing to do with everybody being xenophobic or something. It is just different cultures that are forcedly being intermingled uh, um, without people consenting there um, uh, too quickly. If, it, if this happens too quickly, um, then things become worse and people see it. Economically, uh, chances are going down for that generation uh, for many reasons, but main reason is probably the, the the catastrophic 
energy policy Germany is pursuing. I've been explaining that in the last interview with you, with yours, as, as I said, too, we have abandoned nuclear power and coal power at the same time. Uh, and even the gas, especially Russian pipeline gas, has been cut off from ours. Uh, there's no real replacement. Area. All replacements are much more expensive. And uh, we are losing our productive capacity. Germany has been an industry powerhouse all over the world. Everything, all this is changing uh, currently. So yes, I do believe that politically, uh, this does play into our favor and into our cards. Uh, but uh, I am not there to just uh, promote and make life better for AFD party. But I went into politics to save Germany and uh, we are running out of time. Uh, so the young generation has has right, that uh, they are right voting for us. Uh, I really hope that the middle ages uh, come to reality uh, quickly too. Yes, I hope so too, because in the end it will be intergenerational effort. You know, we yeah. have to work together. And, and and if I may say that, it is a European phenomenon, and it's interesting to hear from you that it's an international phenomenon too. Uh, the young people need a home, whatever nation that is, but I need a home. And uh, if the nations are given up, and that is the worldwide trend, some globalists, and I, I, I don't like that word because I was um, raised uh, very internationally, uh, Globalism for me is not a bad thing. There are reasons for um, the world becoming more globalistic and especially when it comes to economics, it is important to have economies of scale and to have huge production capacities to share the labor internationally. So free trade is important for the welfare of nations, um, but the complete giving up of national boundaries is not what people want. And I can understand that. So uh, there is no contradiction in promoting free trade as we do, but not promoting free movement of everybody all over the world, regardless of borders, uh, who somebody decided should no longer exist. You know, it's the same, same problem here in New Zealand as well, where young people feel like they don't have a future in New Zealand. They move over to, to Australia, which is, is close by. And they can't afford to buy houses because especially immigration levels are very high and restrictions on building and all kinds of other problems. And then the price of everything goes up and young people just feel like they haven't got a home and they haven't got a future here. And we want to avoid that as well in New Zealand, just like you do in Germany. And we have the same problem all over the world. Whenever I talk to patriotic people from every country in the world, it's the same problem. And so it's great at least to see the younger generations seeing the problem and wanting to turn it back and, and hopefully yes. everyone gets in on that. Well, speaking of the war in Ukraine as well, you've re referred to it a few times and I was looking at the results in, in Thuringia and Saxony and there seemed to be a new faction on the left. The left support seemed to largely have collapsed and there was a new faction, the BSW. I can't pronounce the name in, in Germany, but you'll be familiar with uh, who's running that. And it seems like that party is also more so against mass migration, also very much opposed to continuing to to fuel the, the war in Ukraine with Russia, scared about the risk of escalation and, and going to war with Russia like some of the other parties want. So can you explain what's happening there on the left as well? And is there some synergy that you have? Yes, it's a good question because it's really a new phenomenon. Uh, the old left, the former SED social um, Unity Party, the former GDR ruling party, which still exists in Germany to this very day, uh, was finished uh, a year ago. They really, uh, well, they were a, a very small party. They became a very small party. And then one person from that party called Sarah Wagenknecht, and that is what the S and the W stands for in that uh, abbreviation, which you just mentioned, BSW. Bündnis, so the group of Sarah Wagenknecht. It's really a one-person show, actually, with very, very, very few members. Uh, still, they got uh, 12 or 16 percent in those two elections uh, after just nine months after foundation, which is incredible. But uh, there's two reasons, and you mentioned them both. Uh, a, allegedly, but just allegedly, they're against mass immigration. Uh, that is a myth. Uh, it is not true. Um, the voting and all those people have been, had been in parliament in the Deutsche Bundestag. Uh, before they never voted against mass immigration uh, so they have no track record whatsoever but for some reason the media and they themselves um, well do not uh, disagree when you say you are against mass migration uh, they they have not proven that yet uh, so i'm curious what's going to happen but yes that the myth is there i think what is even more important is really their um well their attitude towards the ukrainian war 
they are against that war. They also are against um, weapon deliveries from Germany to the Ukraine. We have the same opinion, maybe for slightly different reasons. Uh, that lady and her group, Sarah Wagenknecht, she really had been a communist herself. She was already a communist um, politician before 1989 in the GDR. Um, so there is some friendship uh, with the so former Soviet Union, which we do not have. Uh, we, we have nothing against Russia, but we do have something against uh, the Soviets and the, against socialism. This lady does not have anything against socialism. She is uh, a socialist party. She's still a member of a socialist party. So economically, uh, she really is on the completely wrong path, which is the former GDR path, um, which obviously will never work. But um, in, in the case of the Ukraine war, she uh, is on the right track, uh, maybe for the wrong reasons. But there also is the right perception that this is not purely a Russian war. And uh, as I already indicated a little earlier in this interview, the story of this war and the history of this war goes way behind 2022. It started probably, uh, you can go back a, a long time in uh, Ukrainian Russian history, uh, centuries actually, but uh, the country was founded in 1991 as a result of the exploded uh, former Soviet Union. Um, and from the very beginning, they have had ethnical differences between the Ukrainians in the center um, and the Russian-speaking people, and especially the ethnic Russians in the very east and the south. Uh, that, that was true from the very beginning. Actually, it had been true before 1991, but uh, within the huge agglomerate, uh, atheistic agglomerate of the so Soviet Union, nobody bothered. Uh, it didn't matter because everybody spoke Russian. Everything was ruled from Moscow. Uh, Kiev did not really have a lot to say, but that changed in uh, 91. And unfortunately, the Kiev people did not treat the um, Russians very well. They're minority Russians, some 17 or 20 percent in today's Ukraine. Um, this went OK for a few years, but uh, it really became tense uh, already in 2008. And there was a, a toppling of the government, which I believe was uh, rightfully um, uh, elected in 2014. Um, and from then on, they had uh, basically a civil war uh, going on in the country. And uh, one must not forget, uh, there was a military demarcation lane in, in, within Ukraine already before 2022. So the war was ongoing. Um, the, the Kiev people bombarded the Russians uh, almost every day. In, uh, there were, so, so this is a long story going back. Uh, I'm not saying that Moscow uh, did not play a role here, a bad role. Uh, and obviously, in, in February 2022, um, Putin invaded uh, Ukraine. That's true. And it was definitely wrong. But what has Europe to do with that? We have nothing to do with that. Actually, it was the U.S. Democrats who played a big role in the, in the Ukraine war. It was not the Europeans, and especially not the Germans. Uh, so why should it be our war? And this is not a NATO country. It is not an EU country, too. So there are no contractual obligations uh, for us to interfere here. And still, Merkel uh, and uh, especially our Current Chancellor Scholz, uh, he well, uh, he followed the American orders in this case. I, I can't put it any differently, and uh, we are paying billions and billions uh, for weapons uh, being sent in the, to the Ukraine. It is an open secret that this war could have ended in early summer 2022. There was a peace uh, contract negotiated between the well, the Ukrainians and the Russians in Istanbul. But the West, in this particular case, Boris Johnson from the UK interfered and um, denied Zelensky uh, signing this contract, uh, which would have saved, I'm convinced about that, one million lives. One million soldiers have died in that incredible war. Uh, and yes, Russia does have some part of the guilt here, uh, but it is not only Russia. So we would like to keep Germany out of that war. And yes, Mrs. Wagenknecht uh, comes to the same conclusion. So here we do actually agree. Mm -hmm. Yes, you uh, want to keep Germany out because you uh, think Germany should come first and that you, you want to be independent of this. And she has the same view, but because she wants to be friendly with Russia, basically. <laughs> That's sort of the impression I'm getting. Right. Um, we are not 
extremely friendly with Russia, even though sometimes we are called slaves of Putin, uh, whatever the mass media uh, says about us, but it's just not true. But yes, we see it from a German perspective and there is no economic, no geopolitical, and also no moral reason uh, to support one side in this uh, war. Both sides are guilty to some extent and uh, they could have come to terms to a peace agreement easily had it not been for the West. And we would not like to be part of that um, permanent inter interference which has been going on for at least 20 years now in Ukraine. At least Germany does have different interests. That's our conviction. Uh, but obviously, the other parties disagree. And that, that, that holds true for the Christian Democrats, too, who, were they in power on a federal level, which they currently are not, uh, would probably be even more uh, hawkish uh, when it comes to that war. And uh, a question going back to the state elections that you've won and the one that's that's coming up as well. And I believe you've got an, a national election perhaps next year or, or the year after that. But before before I ask about that, do you have the power to block certain constitutional votes in, in Thuringia or perhaps in Saxony? Is there something concrete that you have with your minority status, uh, the, the, the large block that you have? Because um, I've seen some conflicting reports on what exactly you have the ability to block, to stop them. Even if they won't include you in the government, they'll create a government of every single party, sort of a unity government against you, but you still have some power, right? Could you explain how that works? Yes, you did your homework. You obviously read the reports pretty closely. Uh, this is a difficult topic, but obviously there are different thresholds uh, for power. If you have 50%, obviously you can form a government of your own. We don't have that, uh, not even in Thuringia where we have 33%. Then there is a threshold of 25%, uh, which is also important. Uh, you can um, constitute and demand um, certain councils investigating uh, political uh, special interest issues, uh, which is uh, interesting. Uh, we have that uh, reached that threshold. In some states, we already have, have had that before. So yes, we have that 25%. Uh, we will also have that uh, in the September elections in Brandenburg, uh, which is another state coming on. We are still working on that um, on a federal level for, uh, let's see what happens in 25. Uh, I, I'm not sure yet. We are now standing at 19, 20%, but uh, we are gaining popularity on a federal level too. So maybe we can um, get uh, to 25% by end 25. And then there's that one third of votes threshold and, or one third of mandates, I should say. Uh, we are close to that. Actually, in Thuringia, we have reached it. In Saxony, it's very close. Uh, and you can prevent some judges to be nominated if you have the threshold. So it's, it's not a very important threshold, I must say. But uh, the other parties make a big deal of that because for the first time, and, and they really say it like that, um, I just heard it today, they have to deal with um, AFD. Uh, up until today, for 10 years, they uh, did not speak to us. They did not make any deals with us. Now they have to make some deals, at least in those uh, very rare cases when an, a judge is, has to be nominated. I think it's not a very powerful position. It's not a very important threshold. But yes, it is there. And uh, at least psychologically, <laughs> um, the others make a big deal of that. Personally, I would like to see the 50% threshold because it's only then that we don't have to deal with the others uh, if they don't uh, want to make any compromises with us now. Well, thank you very much for, for all of those answers. And that makes some sense to me. Yeah. And I think perhaps a big deal has been made out of it, even though there's very little in it for you. It's almost like every just tiny little uh, shred of influence that you have uh, is enough to drive them crazy. They already... Absolutely. That's not the plot. exactly how I would put it. And what are you hoping for in the election campaign? Uh, going forward, it's another year and a half away then. Do you see things continuing to go in your favor? Uh, do you see risks ahead? What's your, your hope for the next year and a half? And is there anything... Oh, ever, everything really... Live? Everything we have been doing, everything I have been doing in my whole political life um, is rational, is not radical in any way. It's just normal politics. It's uh, common sense uh, politics, which we're doing. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And if people looked into our politics uh, and maybe neglected uh, some wrong rhetoric of some people, um, then uh, they would see it too. So our main problem is the media, which does not convey those facts, they, they just do not transmit that. Uh, obviously, you are an exception now, uh, but uh, probably um, our results are not 
too much being influenced from New Zealand. <laughs> um, so thank you for that interview, but uh, we need more of that. Uh, we need the, the German media on our side. Uh, we have the alternative media to some extent, and uh, our election results correlate a lot uh, with the alternative media if they are not censored. And this is the current step. The alternative media are being censored. It is an international um, thing. Uh, we know that Facebook is doing shadow banning all the time. The same for YouTube and the X um, platform from Elon Musk used to censor. Elon Musk now is censoring less. Uh, and now we have just uh, seen the arrest of Pavel Durov, the, the chief of the Telegram platform, uh, which is a real warning shot uh, by, from the establishment against the alternative platforms. Uh, okay, he was released now, but he is still hold, held hostage in, uh, in France. So there are dangerous developments to free speech. Uh, we do rely with our politics on free speech and uh, unframed um, speech and unframed, unframed uh, expressions of our opinions. If we achieve that, and it's a very hard way, very hard to do that in Germany, um, then 50% of people would vote for us. Our votes correlate almost 100% with the people um, watching alternative media or at least not watch the mainstream media. <laughs> um, that, that that would be helpful. But uh, the main dinosaur in German uh, mainstream media is the uh, directly state funded or almost directly state funded monopolist uh, who receives 9 billion directly from the people and people are obliged to pay to these um, uh, to these platforms like the German first and second program of TV and uh, uh, were it not for them we would already be way beyond 40% I'm absolutely convinced about that it's all a question of messaging yes so every every AFD voter has to pay for propaganda against them so you have you're paying for them to attack you basically and we have a similar situation in, in New Zealand with state media as well and uh, yeah it's a big it's a big problem because you're not just fighting somebody else's money you're basically they're taking your money and fighting you with it and it's, uh, it's, it's such it's a terrible perverse idea. but it's the same in many countries I know well thank you thank you very much for joining me thank you very much for your time and I uh, hope all goes well and that uh, you'll be back on the show at some point in the future with uh, with more good news Thank you for having me and uh, all the best to Down Under. Thanks for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. 